All right, so welcome everyone. Welcome to another learning session. So Parity uh, Delivery Services is doing this um, regular learning sessions for us to take a little bit deeper dive into substrate. And today we're going to be uh, talking about two palettes, actually. They're related, that's why we're coupling them together. One is the identity palette, and the other one is the Nix palette. Most of you have already seen the Nix palette before because it's in the substrate tutorials. So uh, the presenters today will be Frank Bell, an application engineer here at Parity, Nacho, solutions engineer, and myself, support engineer. So the agenda, how we break up the presentation, we're gonna start with discussing the palette's purpose, high level purpose. And then we're gonna dig into its features, why it's interesting. Nacho is gonna talk a little bit about the dependencies that it has with other frame palettes. And then he's gonna, he has a, a demo prepared for all of you that's gonna be interesting uh, with the identity palette. So you're gonna see how to create on-chain identities. And then Frank is gonna take us into a deep dive into the code and, and show you some interesting pieces of the code. So you can see there in between the demo that Nacho is gonna give and Frank's code, there will be a Q and A for the audience. And after that Q and A for the non-technical folks, if you wanna drop off the call, that's fine because after that, Frank's gonna go into the code and. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit, okay? So let's get started. Let's actually start with the Nix palette. The Nix palette, first of all, it's like, why is it called Nix? When I first started working here at Parity, I was like, you know, what, what's Nix? Like, who is Nick, right? Nix is actually, it, it's like nickname, right? You can think of nickname, right? So Nix is an example palette. It's not production ready, all right? So it's not meant to be used in production, but it has a, not, a lot of uh, nice uh, code that you can reference, you can read, that is a good starter palette for one to get to know a little bit about substrate palettes, all right? So if you're new to substrate palettes, you wanna start looking at the code, Nix palette is, is a, it's a nice little palette to look at. And it has some basic extrinsics you can see there, essentially you can give yourself a name on chain right a nickname right so instead of your long account id there you can actually change it to say bob right or or daniel or whatever you want it to be so there's also a substrate tutorial that shows how to integrate the nix palette into your runtime all right so it's a great way to start out to learn substrate uh, However, we have the identity palette, which is a much uh, more feature-rich palette that one can use in production, and it is being used in production. And the formal definition you can see there on the screen, it says a federated naming system allowing for multiple registers to be added from a specified origin. These registers can set a fee to provide identity verification service. So you have a concept of these registers, and these registers are the ones that are providing the identity, identity verification, right? And it says that anyone can put forth a proposed identity for a fixed deposit and ask for reviews by any number of registers by paying the registers fee. Okay, so that's the idea. And what does the register do? do the register uh, registered judgments are given as an enum, allowing for sophisticated multi-tier opinions. So these opinions, uh, Nacho and Frank will actually show you the different uh, opinions that can be given by a registrar in terms of like how, uh, how they judge the identity. So as a recap, the only keywords that you really wanna be, you know, you wanna look at that kind of stand out is the concept of a registrar. So you have, with the identity palette, you have an on-chain registrar, multiple, 
and the registers are the one that provide the identity identity verification service. How do they do that? They do that via judgments. And you can think of a, a judgment as an attestation of a register over how accurate some identity info is in describing an account. Okay? And you're going to actually see what that all means in action. So we can kind of summarize the identity palette. You can see there it says the identity palette allows to, it essentially allows you to create an on-chain identity, right? And that's pretty cool. And how can you do that? Well, you can do that by having uh, your identity approved by a registrar. And you can see there in the screenshot, here's a, a real world case. If you go to like polka.js and you go to the um, staking section on polka.js, you'll see all these validators. And I don't know if you noticed, but a lot of them have names, right? You can see that one, the screenshots P2P on the upper right, P2P.org, and it's got a green verification symbol, right? That means it's been verified. So P2P.org is a verified identity. Who has it been verified? You can see on the left there, it says registrar number one. So whoever registrar number one is, they verified this uh, P2P.org they verified the identity. So it's being used in production right now. Uh, it's pretty cool. And you can see also that the identity consists of, in this case, in the lower right, you can see the email, website, Twitter, and such, right? So that brings us to like the idea of, you know, what, what create, what, what can you do? What, what, what can you specify in an identity, an on-chain identity with the identity palette, all right? There are some default attributes. You can see on the screen there, you can, there's email, image, Twitter, right? You can connect your Twitter. Um, there, but you're not limited by these. There, you can also have custom fields uh, within the identity, all right? So that's also a possibility. The identity palette also has supports the, the concept of uh, sub identities. So here's an excellent example back to the p2p.org. You can see that it has quite a few sub identities, right? It's got multiple validators. And instead of p2p.org creating duplicate information for each one of these validators, it, it can create one identity that has the email, the website, and such, and then have the other uh, validators become have sub identities under that main identity. Okay, and that's what you're seeing there. So you can have sub identities with the identity palette. The palette itself has several extrinsics. Uh, for the the basic extrinsics, you you can think of you can set your identity. And in order to do that, you have to reserve uh, a, a small amount. You can clear your identity. And once you've set your identity, you can then request judgment on your identity from a registrar. And in order to do that, you also need to pay the registrar's fee. OK, so as well as there's extrinsics for sub identities, creating sub identities. So once you have an identity created, you can then create sub identities if that makes sense in your use case. On the side of the registrar, the registrar has a few extrinsics. It can set its fee, right? So whatever fee it requests to provide judgment, it can make it a high fee, a small fee, uh, whatever it wants. It can also set the fields in which it's providing judgment on, right? It doesn't need to provide judgment on 20 different fields it can specify which fields it will provide the judgment on by using the, the set fields extrinsics. And then the last one, probably the most important one, is provide judgment. So that's where it will the, the, the registrar will actually provide judgment on an identity. That's the extrinsic. And for, you could think, for pseudo users or governance, we have the ability to add registrars. So the way that registrars get added on chain is via governance, you can think in that way. Right, and the register, the the governance also has the power to kill an identity, to remove an identity completely. So I'll hand it off to 
Nacho to uh, continue with uh, dependencies, uh, frame dependencies for the identity palette. Thank you, Bruno. So yeah, let's take a look at the uh, dependencies with other frame palettes or libraries. Uh, for the palette identity, uh, it depends on frame system and frame support, as I would say all of the frame palettes. And there is only one uh, small dependency in the palette alliance. Uh, uh, it just uh, used one uh, enum from the palette identity, the identity field. We'll take a look at it uh, later on. Um, for the palette nix, uh, depends on also the frame system, frame support. Uh, there is not any other palette that depends on, on this palette, uh, probably because it's maybe too simple and also it's not production ready. Let's take a look at uh, let's take a look uh, at uh, how it's implemented in Kusama and Polkadot. Uh, you can see here uh, the configuration for uh, Kusama. Uh, as you can see, you can uh, configure uh, this constant. Uh, the deposit, the basic deposit, is the 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 balance, the amount that uh, uh, whoever wants to add identity needs to reserve. From field deposit is uh, extra uh, deposit that that identity would have to reserve per uh, extra field that uh, they want to add to their identity. Sub account deposit is extra deposit they have to add per uh, account that is hanging from the main identity. And then uh, these ones are pretty straightforward: uh, the maximum uh, sub accounts, additional fields, and register. Another thing to to mention it's uh, this type, the type is last. Uh, now it's uh, equals to treasury. It means that when um, an identity is killed by a root origin, uh, the deposit, the reserve deposit, instead of going back to the identity, it will go to the treasury. If we equal it to null, what will happen is the deposit will be will get burned. Uh, let's go with the demo. <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll add uh, an identity. Uh, we'll add a uh, sub account for that identity. Next step will be to add a register. Uh, uh, adding a register, uh, it has to be done in three steps. First, just to add the register. Then you have to set the fee of that register. It means uh, the fee that the register is asking for providing a judgment. Uh, and then also the fields what uh, fields that the register is going to judge. Uh, finally, uh, the identity will request adjustment. The register will uh, provide adjustment and will, will, and will clear the identity. Here we have um, uh, Polkadot local testnet. <laughs> OK, so let's go with uh, the first step. Let's. At an identity. Okay, so here you can uh, see the the fields. Uh, this this will be the extra field. Uh, so Bob wants to add uh, uh, here uh, its uh, Instagram, and then these are like the default uh, fields that uh, you can add to your to your identity. Uh, the display, that's the name that will be displayed, uh, your legal name, uh, the website, the Riot account, um, an image if you want to add like URL for your profile picture, and the Twitter account. Okay, so Bob will add uh, his identity. Okay, and um, here we have uh, the events. Uh, how the identity was added, and here we have also. Uh, let's take a look. We need. We have here the deposits. Okay, so what the uh, what we are expecting is uh, a deposit for the identity for the basic deposit, and then for the extra field. This would be a total of this value. That we are here reserved exactly. So this is the total balance that uh, has been reserved uh, for Bob. If we take a look at the. So what I told you before about the 
that the, the values of the deposit, we can take a look at them here. Okay. Field deposit. Okay. And then let's take a look at the identity that has been added. Okay. Yeah. So here we have all the information, and here we have the judgments. Uh, this is empty uh, for now until uh, we request uh, adjustment and a register provide the adjustment. Sorry. Okay. Now that we have uh, an identity. Let's add a sub account. Oh, also, I wanted to mention here, you can see how Bob now became Bob the King. Okay. And here you can find the information uh, without the judgment. Let's add a sub account. Okay, you can uh, attach some uh, information to the, to the sub account. We'll be adding like a Bob the Hunter. Okay. And we can see how more balance has been uh, reserved. This balance reserve it's uh, the, 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 the sub account deposit. Okay, because we only added one sub account, this, this is the total value. And if we take a look now to uh, the account, we can see now how there is here like a sub account hanging from uh, the main identity. And if we go to this sub account, we can see how the parent of this sub account is uh, Bob the key, the main identity. Okay, so now that we have an, an identity and a sub account, let's add a register. Okay, uh, this is important. Uh, only a root origin can add the uh, registers. So it's Alice uh, for our test uh, network. And uh, we'll, we'll say that Charlie is going to be our register. Okay, we should, uh, this register should exist uh, here. Yeah, here it is. And as you can see, the fee and the fields uh, are empty. So that's what we are going to do next. Okay, so we have to choose the register to sign this transaction. And we are setting this fee. This is the index because there is only one register, so Charlie is index zero. And uh, yeah, this is the fee. So basically, what we are saying here is okay. So I'm Charlie. I'm a register, and if you want me to provide adjustment, you need to at least reserve this amount. Let's set the fee. Okay, it's been updated here. And now let's add the, the fields. Okay, uh, this is wrong. Okay, this is how the, the Polkadot app decoded the, the extrinsic, uh, but uh, we have to 
what is expecting here is a hexadecimal value. So I'm going to explain how to calculate this value. OK. So uh, we have this number identity field. Uh, basically, it implements uh, the bit flags. So if you want to add, for example, in our case, it's going to be web and email. What you need to do is to, to apply the OR operator to this, uh, this uh, bits values. We get this value, the bi this binary uh, value that corresponds to this hexadecimal value. Okay, here it is, so web and email. Okay, so here what the register is saying, every time I provide adjustment, I will be only judging uh, your web and your email. Okay, so now that we have the register, let's request adjustment. Okay, so Bob. Bob the King is going to request uh, the judgment. Okay, so it failed with the fee changed. This this is because the the amount that we are trying to reserve is not enough. So let's uh, increase the amount, match the the fee requested by the register, and this time it should work yeah perfect okay so let's take a look at the storage one thing i forgot to mention before is uh, let's take a look at uh, the soups of uh bob we should see how bob the hunter is hanging from it and the opposite if we take a look at the super off of of the hunter here we have uh sorry i just no yeah here we have Bob the hunter so um what's next so we created um the we uh request adjustment okay so if we go back to the identity of bob identity of bob yeah we can see in the judgment is the fee paid so this means that uh it's waiting for a, a judgment okay from index zero which is which is charlie so let's uh, provide the judgment Charlie, yeah, I have it here. Okay. Okay, Charlie will provide adjustment. Uh, it's on index, uh, and this is the target uh, Bob the King. Uh, we'll say that it's uh, non good. Right. And now if we take a look at uh, Bob the King, now we see how the non-good uh, judgment is attached to it and how by default, what well, this is actually Bob the King now, and, and how by default uh, the sub accounts are also, let's say like in this case, like a, like kind of like generate whatever it's the judgment of uh, their parent. Okay, uh, final step. So we got the judgment, and now let's say that Bob uh, wants to clear uh, its identity and get uh, refunded. Well, not really get refunded, but uh, like uh, unlocking, uh, unlocking the reserved uh, balance. So what he can do is to clear the identity.
Okay, so if we take a look at the events, we can see here how the whole amount has been unreserved. Now, if we refresh, Bob lost uh, say identity. Uh, there is another a way of clearing identities. It's using the Kila identity. Uh, it should be done by the root origin, and what will happen is when I explained before. So in this case, the observed amount will go to the treasury. So I think that's all. I'll pass it to my colleague Frank. Firstly, thanks to the other two guys for doing such a great job. Um, I'm going to go too much into the config side of it because it was covered so well. Um, so just a very high level. Um, so really just looking at the identity config. Um, so the interesting things are just the usual um, currency requirements, which is uh, using the reservable currency trait. And in a typical runtime, we normally just pass on the balances palette to provide the currency. And obviously we use that for um, reserving currencies when we take deposits. And then we've got the various deposits um, which we mentioned before so in this instance it's just you know ten dollars per deposit uh, 250 for a field etc and then we've got a couple of additional parameters which are used for banding um, because on-chain uh, storage is expensive um, in this particular um, runtime i'm not doing anything with slashing but in the kasama and polka dot as well as the kitchen sink they all use the treasury palette and then the next section, really, we've just got the, the different origins, one for forcing um, different extrinsics and another one for the uh, for the registrar. And in both instances, they just use the um, ensure origin trait to be able to configure that. Um, so if we just now quickly look at the palette itself, uh, first, we just wanted to go through the, the various storage items on the palette. Um, mostly just so you can see how it differs or how it's been modeled based on what you saw through the demo. Um, so the first item that we look at is, is the identity. Um, and really that's just storing a, a registration by an account. So if you look at the registration item, um, on that particular struct, we've got the deposit, which is the basic, basic fee deposit that that's configured. Then we've got the actual information that was provided. Um, and if we drill into that, you'll then see the various fields that have been described before, sort of predefined fields. And then we've also got the additional fields, which is again, constrained by the maximum field limit. And really that's just a vector of tuples, um, which stores data. So in other words, you know, name or key value pairs. So the data can obviously be none, um, it could be raw or it can be a hash and they're all constrained by um, 32 bytes. So we just go back. And so that's the identity info and go back again. There's the registration and go back one more. So that's the identity. Um, and then the next item that we're going to look at is the super of. And the reason I wanted to kind of call this out is because I personally found it a little bit confusing in terms of the naming. But essentially, the super of is storing the identities or the names um, which you, which are assigned to any of the sub accounts. So if we have a look at it, we've got the account ID. So that account ID is the actual account ID of the sub account. And really, it's just so we can look up the name of the sub account using its identifier. And then we also store a link or a reference to the account ID of the parents or the super account. And then we also store the data, which is the name that we that we give the, the sub account. Then the next storage item is the subs of, and this really is the sub accounts for an identity. So again, it's per account ID. And then within it, we've got a balance, which is the deposit that's taken for that sub account. Uh, also, uh, the, the total deposit for all the sub accounts, and then we store a vector of all the sub accounts um, which have been added for that particular identity registration. And then finally, we've got the registrars, and again, this is just a, a banded VEC. Um, the important thing here is we're using the registrar index um, to store the registration info or the registrar info rather. So if we drill into that, uh, you'll see that. We've got an associated account ID for the registrar index. Then we've got the fee. That's essentially how much the registrar is going to ch uh, charge to provide judgments. And then we've got the various fields um, which the registrar has 
uh, elected to to provide a judgment on. So if you drill into that, you'll just see that it's a, a wrapper struct around the bit flags um, of identity fields. So um, as Nacho showed, it was just a case of combining those different fields to get the overall value, which is then stored. So if we just go back again. So that's essentially how the, the storage is kind of modeled. Um, just in terms of the errors, I thought the only one that was worth mentioning was a, a sticky judgment. So a sticky judgment is anything that is pending. So that was a deposit has been paid uh, and a judgment hasn't been sort of finalized on it yet, or the judgment has already been deemed erroneous and that's just kind of maintaining the state. So in other words, if one registrar, well, if a registrar has already said that it's erroneous, um, then we're not going to overwrite that value because it's somewhat final. Um, so if we just now go down, events, I wasn't going to cover, nothing particularly interesting. Um, so if we now just look at the extrinsics, so I've essentially just picked out a few um, which are worth sort of discussing. Um, so firstly, adding a registrar. So this is something that can obviously only be done by root. So the first thing, as you'd expect, is that we ensure the origin is the same origin check that's configured to um, ensure that it's, it's properly authorized. Um, at the top as well, we also check in the weights or define the weights based on the max number of registrars. So I think in this instance, it was 20. So the idea here being is that we charge the maximum weight up front, and then at the end of the extrinsic, we actually calculate the actual weight to be charged based on the current number of registrars that are configured um, within the system. Um, so the process of adding a registrar is just simply taking the information that's provided, which is the account, and pushing that, that information um, into the vector, sorry, into the registrar's um, storage item, um, just using that account, and the rest of the values are initialized to the default um, of zeros. Um, so if we go back, so that's adding a registrar. Then the next process would be that the registrar would set a fee or their fields. Um, we're not going to look at set fields because the pattern is pretty much the same approach as in set fee, which we'll have a quick look at. Um, so setting a fee, essentially we're taking in the index of the registrar as well as the fee that needs to be applied. And then all we're doing really is just looking at the registrar's storage item for that particular index. Um, and if it's found, we then also validate to see that the person that's setting the, the transaction or the extrinsic who matches the configured accounts. So in other words, can this registrar set the fee for its own accounts? If that is the case, then we apply the fee. Um, otherwise, we just return errors. Um, so that's that one. We now move on to setting an identity, and this will kind of be the case for an end user. Um, so we'll just drill into that one. So the first thing that we're going to do here, obviously, apart from checking that it's signed, um, is to check the number of fields that have been passed in um, on the uh, registration info um, object, um, just to check to see whether there's been too many fields that have, uh, have been passed in. But more importantly, we use those fields to calculate the total deposit. Um, and this could be because a person's adding fields or removing fields that each time we accept this information we need to recalculate to make sure that the, the correct um, deposit is being held um, so uh, we then check to see whether the extrinsic exists if it does we update it otherwise uh, we create it but you'll see the interesting part here is, is that is sticky that i mentioned earlier so if we just drill into that check you can see there that if it's a pending judgment in other words a fee is paid or a deposit is taken without a judgment or if it's erroneous, then we just um, we don't replace those, we retain those. Um, so just jump back. Then the next phase of this extrinsic is essentially just to handle the deposits. So based on the additional fields that were passed in earlier, along with the basic deposits, which is defined in the config, we set that deposit on the identity. Um, the interesting thing here in comparison to say the, uh, the next palette, is that this in theory would allow the basic deposits to be increased over time through runtime upgrades whereas the next palette it wasn't as advanced um, i think you know, essentially once it was set it was set always um, so once we've got our deposits um, we then need to calculate whether we need to reserve anything more as in 
the, pers the person may have added in a few additional fields, um, or they may have removed additional fields, or perhaps maybe their basic deposit changed, it dropped lower. Um, so depending on that, we either reserve more or we unreserve and return anything due back to the, um, to the user. Um, and then finally, we, we update the storage. And then again, based on the number of judgments and the extra fields that were actually provided, we use that to do the post weight um, calculation to, to pass back to make sure that that um, is all the, the user gets charged. So just go back. Um, then set subs is just setting sub accounts. And really, that's just the case of validating to make sure, firstly, that a registration exists, as was shown in the demo. Um, and then the next thing is to make sure that we don't exceed the maximum number of sub accounts. Um, and then we, we get the sub accounts um, to essentially do the processing uh, and then calculate the deposit based on the existing sub account deposits, as well as the number of um, sub accounts which are passed in. Um, then we also do a check to make sure that the sub accounts that the person is trying to register haven't been already registered to somebody else, um, returning a already claimed error, if that is the case. Um, the next phase is to adjust the deposits as before. And then the slightly trickier part um, is how I described earlier, how the storage is sort of separated. So firstly, we, we process the identities, which is the sub accounts and their, and their names. So it removes all of them to make sure that the ones that have been passed in don't apply in storage. And obviously we have storage layers and everything's cached before being committed. Um, and then once that's been removed, we then work through processing by adding them in. And you can see that essentially we are adding the sub account based on its sub account ID. The sender, which would be the parent account, that's adding this particular sub account and its name. Um, then the last phase is to, so that's handling the, the identity names for the sub accounts. Then the next phase is to actually add the list, update the register of accounts that are registered for particular parents or super um, accounts. So really it's the subs of is the, the list of sub accounts for that have been registered. So again, if there's nothing there, we remove it. Otherwise, um, we add the deposits for the various accounts, which only apply to this particular call, along with the actual IDs. Um, I think there was a note on this particular one saying that you know it's not optimized. So you can kind of see the way it processes through. You know, there could be some improvements there. Um, then the quit sub I thought was kind of interesting because essentially this caters for if a sub account is being maliciously added. So for example, if somebody went and added your personal address as a sub account to theirs, you could submit an extrinsic to say, um, you know, you want to opt out of being a sub account for somebody else. And the difference here is that whatever uh, deposit was taken from the original person that registered the identity and created the sub account, instead of the deposit going back to them, it actually is then repatriated back to the sub account. So that basically means that you know you can claim it, you get the funds for it. Um, but the other interesting thing that I saw here was that by default, um, for the actual weight, it's using max sub accounts, which I believe is a hundred. But at the end of the extrinsic, there's no sort of update in terms of, you know, referring back to, well, um, giving back the additional uh, funds that, that weren't required. So in theory, that could be quite an expensive extrinsic to, to, to send, and it might not be worth actually claiming it back depending on how much the actual deposit is that's reserved. Um, and then just the final two ones, um, requesting a judgment so from the perspective of somebody that's registered an identity and wants judgment from a registrar. So they will pass in the, the registry index and the maximum fee that they're willing to pay. Um, the first bits is just the usual, making sure that the registrar exists based on the index that's provided, making sure that the fee that they provided is, is greater than the, the registrar fee that they charge. Um, and then the next step is basically to add the uh, 
the judgment request to the judgments on the identity based on the um, registrar index. And in doing so, essentially, we, we, uh, we, we reserve the registration fee to, to do that process. Again, you can see there's some allowance for, for the judgments there as well. Um, and then once that's been processed, once the, the judgment has been requested, we just update the storage. And then uh, in this instance, an event that's kind of worth mentioning is maybe the judgment requested event that's emitted could be used by the registrar to essentially log uh, a queue of all the, the, the judgment requests that are due to them so that they can process that as and when they, they want to do that. Um, and then finally, the provide judgment. Um, so this would be the registrar providing a judgment after it's been requested. Um, the interesting thing here is essentially they pass in the hash of the identity um, to make sure that what they pass in judgment is exactly the same data in storage. Um, so as part of the process, we validate that here by obviously checking to see that the identity exists, the registrar matches, et cetera. But then once we've got the registrar identity, we then hash it and then compare it with the hash that was pro provided with the extrinsic call um, to make sure that essentially the registrar is um, providing a judgment on, on the actual um, data as, as they expected to see it. Um, and then the next phase of it is essentially working through, looking at the judgments for the particular registrar. Um, if that particular judgment status is set to fee paid, then uh, what, in other words, deposit taken, then we take that deposit and move it from, from being reserved for the particular identity and we move it or repatriate it to the registrar so they can claim the fee for providing the judgment. Um, and then update the judgment to whatever was set. I'm not sure I mentioned what the judgment was, but just as an example, those are some of the, the different um, enum variants, which you may have seen in the drop down on the demo. So if we just go back. Um, and then once we've applied the judgments, um, the last phase of it is just to obviously update storage with the new identity state. Um, sending out the judgment given uh, event. And then finally, the same pattern applies with, you know, um, updating the weight with the number of judgments and the extra fields so that um, only the correct weights are charged. And I think that's about it. And the, the next palette really is, you know, as they said, not for production use. Um, there are a couple of things which make it pretty obvious. Uh, an example is um, in the set name, for example, I think we check the, min length, the, the minimum length and the maximum length. But then as an example later on, if we use the false name extrinsic from the root, we only check to see whether it's too long and we don't actually check the min length. Um, and then likewise, you know, some of the, extrin uh, the weights and some of the um, extrinsics haven't been optimized as well as they have in the identity palette. Uh, thank you all for this session. Thank you for joining. And uh, we'll see you in the next one.